Uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, John Banville uh, is here in Krakow for the second time, and both of these occasions are very natural for us. Uh, two years ago, he was invited by us to uh, join us at the Konrad Festival. And why is it natural for him to be uh, among writers invited for Konrad, and why it is natural for us to invite him uh, for Konrad? Konrad is all about uh, praising great European novel of ideas, and John Banville uh, is one of the greatest, or just mainly the greatest uh, novelist dealing with uh, ideas. Uh, now he is a guest of Copernicus Festival, uh, which is also very natural uh, for the writer who wrote at certain point of his literary career a novel called Dr. Copernicus, the first installment of his so-called science trilogy, or as some critic critics used to say, science tetralogy. But let me start with an anecdote John told me a year ago in Dublin. But uh, John, will you let me to tell this anecdote in Polish? Because, you know, it, there is a problem with me speaking jokes in, in English. You know, people are laughing at me, not with me. Uh, mniej więcej rok temu, proszę Państwa, w lutym uh, odwiedziłem Johna Banwila uh, w Dublinie, w jego bardzo pięknym studiu rozmawialiśmy o relacji pomiędzy nauką a literaturą. W pewnym momencie zacząłem go pytać o animozję pomiędzy pisarzami i naukowcami. Wtedy John opowiedział mi kapitalną anegdotę. Mianowicie został zaproszony przez swoich przyjaciół na przyjęcie, okolicznościowe przyjęcie. Nie pamiętam, czy to były urodziny, czy, czy imieniny kogoś. Na którym to przyjęciu był także bardzo znany wzięty neurochirurg. Gdy tylko się dowiedział, że John Banville zajmuje się pisaniem, podszedł do niego i powiedział, że to się świetnie składa, ponieważ on po przejściu na emeryturę zamierza napisać powieść. Na co John Banville odpowiedział, że to się jeszcze nawet lepiej składa, ponieważ on po przejściu na emeryturę zamierza zająć się neurochirurgią. A... I thought that this anecdote is very good for the beginning of our conversation about the relationship between science and literature, uh, not only in the context of your work, but also in the, con in the broader context. Uh, let's start with this. Is it possible to keep a good and fruitful relationship between the world of literature and the world of science? Um. No, I don't think so. <laughs> but please don't uh, end here. Uh, when I wrote Dr. Copernicus, I had come to a stage in my life as a writer where I could continue to be an Irish writer and continue to write Irish novels. And I didn't want to do that. Um, I was young. I was very ambitious. I was very hubristic. Uh, at the time, there was a series of paperbacks uh, in English called Fontana Modern Masters. So it would be George Steiner writing on Heidegger. And, and I could see way in the future my name on the spine of one of these books. Uh, Van Mullen Modern Master. It didn't matter who would write about me. So I thought I would be, as you said in your introduction, one of the great European novelists of ideas. I tried in Copernicus, I tried in the following book, uh, Kepler, to write about ideas, to incorporate ideas into fiction. And I think I failed. Now, all works of art are failures, but Looking back now, I think it was probably the wrong direction to take, but it was fruitful. But I remember at the time my wife used to say to me, stop being mesmerized by facts. Facts are merely facts. They're not necessarily the truth. And I'm afraid this is where the distinction comes, that in Science, truth, and fact are the same thing. But in art, they're not. Truth
truth in art is something other than factual. So I, I can't, I certainly failed to combine the two, but it was an interesting effort. One writes what one writes, and I can't now deny it or, or abandon it. But what, why do you think that this enterprise, literary enterprise, was a, a wrong move, or a good move to a wrong direction? The trouble is that when you take a fact from the world of science, or even from the world of nature, and impose it on a fiction, the two will not blend together. It's like collage. You have a, a painted picture and then a piece of newspaper stuck onto it. It may look nice and it may be interesting, but it's not, it doesn't blend. Now, I don't quite know why that is, but I know it is <laughs> a fact. Uh, science is a discipline which has rigor. You can prove or disprove a scientific hypothesis. You cannot prove or disprove a sonnet or a novel. Uh, they simply, they either work at some unprovable level or they don't. But a scientific hypothesis you can disprove. As, you know, Karl, Karl Popper, the philosopher Karl Popper says that, you know, science, real science is distinguished by the fact that it can be falsified. Like, uh, scientific theory can be falsified. But you cannot falsify uh, a work of art. Yeah, it's either good or bad, it works or it doesn't. Um, but I do believe that the creative force behind science and behind art is the same. It starts out from the same place in, in the imagination. And the reason that I, one of the reasons I wrote books about Copernicus and about Kepler, these scientific figures, is that I was fascinated when I read about them to discover that they didn't much care how things actually are in the universe. What they cared about was finding a system that would, as they used to say, save the phenomena. A system that would account for how things look, but would not necessarily have to be true. This fascinated me, uh, and it still does. In other words, they were trying to impose a system. They were trying to impose an order upon an incoherent world, which is what artists do as well. Now, the kind of order that we try to impose, that artists try to impose, is different to the scientists' notion of order, but it springs from the same urge, the same urge to make sense of incoherence. But could you tell us what is the difference between the order imposed by a scientist and the artist? Because once we talked about this relationship and then about uh, science and literature relationship, or science and art relationship. You told me um, that literature goes to a different direction, deals with the world in a different way, uh, giving up the rigor and absorbing a different attitude towards yeah. what's real. And now you're saying that there is a system, and I agree, yeah, I know that artists do something similar. But there is a difference, and this difference is crucial. This difference is crucial for us organizing this festival, because there is still uh, science and humanities, or science and art, science and literature. Uh, this end means that there is a similarity, and this end means also that there is a difference. Well, I think that the word that we <clears throat> need to consider is imagination. A scientist imagines a system into existence. An artist imagines a work of art into existence. Um, science, uh, scientists are, 
as we know, just as arrogant as, as artists. And they imagine that, they imagine, they believe that their theories are factually true. At the end of the 19th century, uh, professors of physics were telling their students, look, give it up and do something else, because we found out everything there is to know. The Newtonian universe was a perfect explanation for how the world works, perfect explanation for reality. And then, in 1905, Einstein said, um, you know, like the kid at the back of the class, like, um, um, I, I just want to ask a question. Uh, and everything was turned on its head. I have absolutely no doubt, it won't happen in my time, but I have no doubt that Einstein's theory itself will be, if not turned on its head, then certainly modified. Because the world as Einstein conceived it, and the world as quantum physics conceives it, uh, they're incompatible. So that there is behind relativity, behind quantum theory, there is another system that, as I say, I don't think it will be found in my time. When I was younger, I hoped that it would, but I don't think it will because it is so complicated. But somebody, you know, maybe 20, 50 years' time will say, like Einstein, um, hang on, and a new system will come. So science, which imagines itself to be completely rigorous and completely factual, when you look at it closely, you realize that it is... It springs from the imagination. It was Einstein's great imaginative feat to say, what would happen if you were traveling at the speed of light? What would happen if you're traveling in space and you see something else traveling in space? How do you know that you're moving and they're stationary or they're stationary and you're moving? So that was, a, that was an imaginative question. And I remember also that one of the things that encouraged me to write about scientists was I came across a wonderful uh, little anecdote about Einstein. Somebody was saying to him that he had some mathematical problem and he had three possible solutions to it. And Einstein said, pick the most beautiful solution and that will be the right one. Now, what he didn't explain was, how do you define beauty? And if you ask a scientist, well, how do you define beauty? They say, oh, simplicity and grace and elegance. And so you say, yes, but they're just other words for beauty. And they say eventually, it's instinct. It's imagination. You imagine that this is true, and it usually turns out to be true for a certain period of time. You have to remember that we see a tiny segment of the world. Cats and dogs can see in the dark. They can probably see x-rays, for all we know. They're, as we sit here, billions of neutrinos are flashing through us. As we sit at everybody, the whole world. It's quite These scary. Neutrino, they, you know, they're flashing through you and me and coming out in Australia and going on. They're produced by the sun, by the billion. We, this is what we cannot feel it. We can't. We'll never be able to see a neutrino. Uh, they manage by putting a whole lot of heavy water into an underwater cavern years ago in, in isolating three neutrinos. But they are immensely small. Uh, they flash through everything. I, I, I'm really making the point that the world that we see, which we take to be the world, is a version of the world. We don't see reality. We see what we conceive to be reality. As Wittgenstein said, we say those things for which we have the words to express. Uh, and I suspect that we see the world that we need to see. But there is behind that world, behind that reality, an entirely other reality that we may never, we may never discover and we certainly will never see but we may intuit, we may imagine it. Some great mind like Einstein's or Newton 
or Copernicus may come along and say, this is, this is another world. But I, I wrote a book called The Infinities uh, a few years ago. And, uh, it was translated into Polish. In that book, there's a scientist who develops... You see, one of the, the, the big problems, as I'm sure most of you know, is that in science, when you, when you have... when infinity comes into an equation, the equation doesn't work. And my man thought, well, what you should do is combine the infinities. And about six months after I finished the book, I read a book by Stephen Hawking, where he was talking about infinities. Um, so, you know, I do believe that there will be something to do with... The, the things that contaminate the equations at the moment, I suspect will be found to be not contamination at all, but merely information from another reality. I will use this anecdote by Einstein about theory, the proper theory or the true theory, uh, that you find uh, proper when you consider it as beautiful. Uh, to ask another question about the differences between science and literature. Uh, how do you, as a writer, perceive the beauty uh, of literature, the beauty of a sentence? You know, the, 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 <coughs> you ask these, easy questions. This event is called uh, How to Die. Oh, do you remember the Czwartą? Uh, is it, uh, is it uh, worthful to uh, die for one beautiful sentence? Uh, well, I wouldn't want to die for a beautiful sentence. I would like to live for a beautiful sentence and then make another beautiful sentence. Um, if you're asking about the different ways in which science and the beautiful in science and the beautiful in literature seek to express the world, <clears throat> then I'd say that I would go back to saying, as I said at the beginning, that both scientists and artists try to impose a kind of <clears throat> sense on a nonsensical world. We know, you know, a novel is nothing like life. We don't experience our being born, we won't experience dying. So we have no beginning and end. All we have is this messy stuff in the middle. But a work of art has a beginning, a middle and an end. It's a finished, burnished, Whole. It's like a, a beautiful crystal globe. And that's why we go to art, to get what the English critic Frank Kermode called the sense of an ending. Uh, that's what we want. We want... <clears throat> because our lives are incoherent. Our brains work 24 hours a day, from the day that we're born to the day that we die. That even when we're asleep, you know, our brains invent these fantastical worlds which in many ways are far more interesting than the everyday world in which we live. But it is incoherent. We, we, we don't know what we're doing. We, all decisions are made in retrospect. You know, we think that we decide something, but we just drift, we drift, we drift. We, can, we drift in an incoherent reality. And art and science both try to find a systematic way of accounting for this world that we drift through. And both fail. Fail gloriously. I mean, Newton's theory of the world is probably what the greatest scientific feat, probably the greatest intellectual feat that any human being ever managed. It's extraordinary what he did. Uh, but it wasn't quite right. Einstein's theory, and Newton was Einstein's great hero. He was the only picture that he had on his wall in his office in Princeton. Uh, but Einstein's theory is not quite right either, as quantum physics shows. Because, you know, at its simplest, quantum physics says that a particle is both a wave and a piece of matter. Now, this is not possible. But there will be another theory that will come along that will say, this is why it just looks like a wave and why it looks like uh, a particle. Let me insist 
on this one question. <laughs> I'm trying to get away from uh, it. I know, I can see that. But uh, if the scientists say that this is instinct that tells him or her that the theory is beautiful, what is it in you that tells you that the finished sentence, the shaped line of your novel or any other text is beautiful enough to be left in the text? Well, that, I, I cannot answer it. I'm not evading. It's, I, I don't know. Um, but I it's was, there, you know. Well, I, look, Paul Valéry said that all works of art, you know, they're never finished, just abandoned. The same is true of a sentence or a, the corner of a picture you're painting or the, the movement in a piece of music you're, you're composing. Uh, you abandon it at a certain point. You say, I cannot get any closer to perfection. It's like the infinitesimal calculus. You get closer and closer and closer to infinity, but you will never get there. You never get perfection. But the most that one can hope for is a kind of a sense of bliss, a momentary sense of transcendence. I don't want to be too mystical or too <laughs> religious about it, but it does, when you get a sentence as near to perfect as you can, you do get this feeling. It's like the, when you hit your fingernail at the edge of a wine glass, you get that ping. And you think, yes, now I must leave it. And frequently, if you, and painters know this particularly, you know, you can work on a painting and work on a painting, and if you hit one dab of color can kill the whole thing. You have to stop before you put that last dab of color. I think the same is true of the sentence or the paragraph or the chapter of the book. You have to stop at a certain point and say, if I do any more of this, it will go flat. Uh, that's the nearest I can come to answering your question. I don't know, and I don't want to know. I mean, why would I want to know what the beautiful is? Uh, uh, Baudelaire says, you know, beauty is the possibility of happiness. Uh, he stole it from Stendhal, who was talking about women. But Baudelaire, Stendhal said a woman is beautiful because she offers a promise of happiness. Baudelaire took this and said, the beautiful with a capital B is the possibility of happiness. And probably that's true. That's another word for, as I said, for bliss. Feeling that sense of delight, but also feeling and this is what great art does and what great science does as well, is it gives you a more vivid sense of being alive. You feel your presence on the earth more vividly when you contemplate a, a, a very beautiful scientific theory or a, a very beautiful work of art. Um, I see no other purpose. I mean, art has no moral, political, social purpose whatsoever. It is gloriously useless. But it does give us, I think, uh, a vivid sense of being alive. And, I mean, you know, the artist tries, at least my kind of artist tries, not to talk about things, but to make things. Um, I don't want to be about anything. I want to be the thing itself. These two realities, science and literature, the world of science and the world of literature, uh, are separated not only because there are differences between, between them, material, essential, they are also separated because it's very difficult for human beings, even intelligent, even very engaged, to cover the field of both of these disciplines. Uh, ten years, something like ten years ago, uh, Hans Magnus Enzensberger wrote a very awkward book. This is a collection of essays and poems. It's called uh, The Elixirs of Science. 
in which he gives uh, poetic biographies of famous scientists, and also he presents his theory about a new uh, mode of education. Uh, the mode that would cover both of these fields and would give us an opportunity uh, to catch up with the uh, running world. We have to, he says, that we have to uh, reinvent our relationship with both science and literature. Do you believe that something like this is possible? Contemporary, well, in contemporary <coughs> world? I'll tell you a little anecdote. My friend, the great Italian writer Claudio Magris, who was at a, a festival where Enzensberger was giving a talk about that book, and George Steiner was sitting in the audience, and Enzensberger gave his theory, and Steiner just put up his hand and said, how do you know it's true? And, you know, Enzensberger had no reply to this. Um, theories are always theories. They're always provisional. They have to be. I would like to see, I'd like more artists to know a little bit about science. And I would like scientists to know a little bit more about art. Um, it is disgraceful that if you were to say, I know nothing and care nothing about Shakespeare or Dante, pick your great artist, uh, it would, you'd be regarded as a barbarian. But you're allowed to say, I know nothing about science. And everybody would nod and say, yeah, I don't know either. That is disgraceful. Um, some of the most beautiful thinking, certainly in the 20th century, was done in physics. Uh, the beauty of that thought, the complexity of that thought, uh, the imaginative genius behind uh, scientists like Heisenberg and Einstein and Niels Bohr, and, you know, it's a long list. Uh, the beauty of that thinking is, it's ravishingly beautiful. But artists don't feel, or readers in general, don't feel they need to know about science. But they should. Look, I'm not an expert. God knows. I mean, I can hardly add two and two. Um, I'm no expert. But I try to, I try to get an imaginative grasp of what scientists are doing. Yeah, and that is possible for anybody. You know. At the beginning of your, of your scientific literary project, there was an idea to write one novel about 20th century mm. physicists. Mm. Uh, how come? How, why did well, you? Well, that's where I started. I wanted, I was so excited by the little bit that I did know about 20th century physics that I wanted to write about a representative figure who would be an amalgam of Einstein and Heisenberg. And, these people, and somehow I found myself writing about Copernicus. And I thought, well, I'll do four books. I'll do Copernicus, I'll do Kepler, I'll do one about Newton, and then I'll do one about my 20th century physicist. I, <laughs> like all such projects, of course, I never finished it, um, because I couldn't. I, I, I wouldn't have been able to write about uh, a 20th century figure because the science is so specialized. You know, Copernicus, Kepler, they could know all there was to know about their science by reading about seven or eight books. Uh, that in the 20th century and in the 21st century is not the case. Uh, and science, you know, the, this is one of the reasons that there may not be, I may be wrong, there may not be another Einstein figure because it is so specialized. It's very, very hard to have an overall grasp of what's going on in science. Um, but there are people, um, you know, at least there were, people who could still move between the disciplines in science, but it's getting more and more difficult because it is so specialized and so complicated. This is partially the answer to the question uh, posed by Ensensberger. 
about the possibility of covering both of these disciplines. If this is so specialized, uh, the possibility to know uh, not everything, but... Yeah, I mean, uh, art is never specialized in the way... It doesn't break up into specializations in the way that, that science has, the way that physics has. Um, you know, you can still... The artist is still in control of everything that he does. Uh, and, he, you know, an artist can can span the, the entire range of his, of his art. The scientists can't do that anymore. But maybe a figure will come along who can grasp enough of the various specializations to make one grand coherent theory. Uh, it's possible. It with, would be difficult, but it is possible. With Copernicus, Kepler, and Newton, uh, especially Copernicus and Kepler, it started uh, at a very young age. You told me that uh, you were like 12 or 13 when you found uh, their lives, their biographies. Yeah, I read... I interesting read, enough yeah. to... I read Arthur Kirstner's The Sleepwalkers, which was a very stimulating book, and I didn't understand it. I read that when I was, I don't know, my early teens, I suppose. And then I went back to it when I was trying to find a way to, to write about creativity without writing about artists. Uh, to examine what it is to be, to make things, to, to, to... Someone once asked Gore Vidal why he'd written a book, and he said, because it wasn't there. It was a wonderful answer. Uh, <coughs> to put objects into the world that weren't there before is the... That's what artists want to do. Scientists are slightly different. They want to put into place a theory that will account for what is already there. So it's a different kind of creativity. But I still think that that creativity comes in the same place in the brain. I feel an affinity with scientists. Even though I have no expertise whatsoever in, in their area, you know, I will never be a brain surgeon. Um, but I do understand how it works at some strange level. I understand the way that you make connections. Sometimes I will go to bed at night with a, a difficulty in a book, and I'll wake in the morning, I will have solved the difficulty. My mind has been working during the night, I've been doing it. Uh, I will be sitting, having dinner, or doing anything, and suddenly I would think, yes, that's, that's the way to write that sentence, that's the way to end that chapter, that's the way to make that piece of the plot. How that happens, I do not know. It's what they used to call inspiration. How did you prepare yourself for writing the Copernicus novel and then Kepler? <laughs> I read a few books. I looked at a few pictures. Uh, and that was about it. I mean, I was well into the book before I thought, my God, this is going to be regarded as a historical novel. And I wasted a lot of time trying to get the historical facts right, which is where my, my wife was, was right in, in telling me not to, be, not to be afraid of the facts, not to be. And then when I did Kepler, I, was, I did it much more imaginatively. Uh, I made up a lot. Um, but I didn't do a lot of research. I would love to say that I spent hours and hours in the library researching it. I didn't, because I don't think that's how art is made. Flaubert said that when he was writing uh, Salambo, that he read, I don't know, a thousand or ten thousand books or something about ancient Carth Carthage. And the book is a wonderful work of art, but you can feel on every page the weight of the research. It's a huge stone on the thing. I think that the imagination is where art is made, and the imagination is the most, it's probably the most important attribute that we have. To be able to imagine, you see, we, we, we live by imagining the world into existence. Um, I wrote a book called The Book of Evidence, which was about a man who committed a murder. And he says about his victim that the problem was that 
he didn't imagine her sufficiently into existence, therefore it was easy to kill her. And we can take analogies from that, look back in the last century. The death of the imagination leads to the death of millions. Um, so the imagination is what The imagination and the sense of being uh, homeless. Wallace Stevens has a wonderful uh, few lines, and I'm thinking of the interpreter, but they're easy lines. He says, from this the poem springs, that we live in a place that is not our own, and much more, not ourselves, and hard it is in spite of blazoned days. I think this is true. We, we make art because we feel displaced. I always think of the artist as being like a snail that has lost its shell. Uh, trying to find a home, trying to find a place to exist, trying to find a system trying to make sense of things. And that, again, I think, is at least similar to what scientists do. But you also, in your novels, you also depict, represent, or recreate the process of drifting in our lives. You let the novel depict what's incoherent in it. You are not imposing a system at that moment. You're showing us what's real about our experience. Yes, but I mean, so does, so does science. Um, science says that, you know, the, the reality itself is incoherent um, insofar as we can see. Uh, it, it has elegance, it has shapeliness, but it doesn't cohere. Uh, if you shoot a subatomic particle at a, a piece of metal that has two holes in it. The particle will go through both of them. It will do, so it's a, a wave and a, and, a, and a particle. This does not make sense. This is, this is chaotic. But yet there are theories. You know, I mean, quantum theory works. Your phone and your watch, you know, it works because of quantum theory. And Einstein found this profoundly uh, disturbing that you could, because what quantum theory says is you cannot have uh, certainty. All you can have is uh, probabilities. And Einstein couldn't accept that. Now, I don't know, maybe, at, maybe as I say, someone will come along and say, here's a way of finding certainty. Here's a way around the probabilities. But in a way, I hope not, because I like the notion of an incoherent world. I like the notion of not being able to make sense of it. There's a certain delight in the incoherence of things. And that's, what, that's one of the reasons that the novel is such a wonderful art form, that it can drift, it can be incoherent, and yet, as I say, it has a beginning, a middle, and an end. Even Finnegan's Wake has a beginning, a middle, and an end, even though Joyce tried to avoid that. But it has, uh, and it has a kind of plot. So that the, the work of art does try to impose a system on an unsystematic world. Can its incoherency be beautiful? Oh, yes. I mean, when I went to Greece, uh, I discovered that the Greeks regarded symmetry as being deeply ugly. If you stand in front of the Parthenon and look at it, it's, it's completely asymmetrical. That's what they consider to be beautiful. We have the notion that symmetry is beautiful. But this was a great discovery for me, that here were these, uh, you know, the ancient Greeks were probably the, the greatest their genius as a people was the greatest that we've known. But they liked things to be sort of askew, slightly disproportionate. Uh, and that probably is where uh, beauty lies, in some kind of disproportionate 
arrangement. Uh, so, you know, we, we will never find the system of systems, but we'll keep trying. Let's get back for a moment to your tetralogy or trilogy. Both of these two first novels about Copernicus and Kepler are great, but the reader can tell that your attitude towards these two figures is a bit different. You seem to like Kepler more than Copernicus. Oh, well, Kepler was, Kepler was an infinitely more likable human being. Copernicus was a cold fish, uh, uh, very, very cautious, very careful. But uh, Kepler had such a life that was so uh, full of incident that I had to suppress most of it because it simply would not have been believed as fiction. Uh, and he also, Kepler was a he reminded me a little of myself, a busy little man running about, desperately trying to live his life, des desperately trying to bring up his children, and at the same time, desperately trying to find a transcendent uh, version of the world. Uh, so I liked him, I liked him a lot. Copernicus is hard to like. And then you moved to Newton, but you uh, wrote a different novel than the first two. Uh, Newton life, Newton's life is there, uh, but something else is in the front. Yeah, I wrote about a historian who's writing about Newton because I, I didn't want to write about Newton. Uh, he's too great a genius, too, too great a systematizer. Um, so I had to approach it from the side. Uh, I mean, you know, Newton, as I say, probably the most beautiful mind that there has ever been. He was a horrible man, really horrible man. Uh, he spent the last years of his life studying alchemy, trying to interpret the Bible. He was appointed by the government to uh, uh, stamp out counterfeiting. He hanged a lot of people who made counterfeit money. Uh, he really did his, his, by the time he was 28, he had really done his, his work as a scientist. The rest of his life was, you know, it was interesting for him, but it wasn't interesting for us. So he was like one of those great poets like Keats or, you know, uh, he, or one of those great musical geniuses like uh, Mozart. It was all done very early on. Uh, by some kind of, it's not a word that I like, but we can't avoid by some kind of miraculous process that we cannot understand. So I didn't want to write about Newton. And then when I did uh, Mephisto, which was the fourth book in this, uh, it was about a sort of ma mathematical genius. But it wasn't about the 20th century physicist that I wanted to write about. And I never will know. I'd be too bored to do it. But this book, Mephisto, the math mathematical genius is actually not a crucial thing in the novel. So the fourth installment to the series is something uh, misleading. Yeah, like I mean, just I, yeah, by that stage I left stopped. it unfinished. By that stage I had stopped trying to be a great European novelist of ideas. <laughs> I knew I would never appear in a Fontana Modern Masters study. Uh, and I decided to trust my instinct and to let my imagination rule. And I still think that was the right thing to do. I went in a new direction. Uh, what I was doing Kepler, I mean, I wrote Kepler based on Kepler's theory of the five perfect solids. Kepler believed that between the seven planets that were known then, or the six planets that were known then, there were five, you could place five perfect platonic solids. Uh, it was a crazy theory, very beautiful. Uh, this is ultimate system. And I wrote the book based on his system. So it was immensely complex and immensely difficult and probably a waste of time. I should have let my imagination flow where I was doing tiny calculations of 
lengths of chapters and lengths of paragraphs and lengths of sentences. Uh, the imagination is all. Uh, this is how we, we make life, we make the world by our imaginations. And that's what I decided to, to do, to become a real artist rather than a great European novelist of ideas. <laughs> Which actually functioned very well. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, I would like you to uh, be a part of our conversation. And this is a moment when you can uh, ask your questions to, to our guests. You said that uh, you wanted to write a novel about 20th century scientists and suddenly you found yourself writing about uh, Copernicus. So, but basically, like, how did it happen? Well, drifting. In, in drifting, I'll tell you that, in fact, Dr. Copernicus, the novel, began as a novel about the Norman invasion of Ireland in the 12th century. I had forgotten about this fact, uh, and I found a manuscript book in which I'd begun to write this novel about the Normans invading Ireland. That turned into a novel about Copernicus. Art is a very mysterious business. Uh, people say to me, where did you get the idea for this, or how did you start this? I never know. I never know where a book started. I, it always seems to have been always going on. And I suspect that all my books are just one great volume, you know, uh, because I, I, I probably only have one, one book, and I just keep doing it over and over again, trying to get it right. There's a wonderful little novel by Robert Coover called Spanking the Maid, a short novel, and it's about a man who gets up every morning, the maid comes in, and he has a spanker. And this just goes on and on, page after page, and he keeps keep trying to get it right, trying to spank the maiden just the right way. And it's a wonderful, witty uh, metaphor for the way the artist works. We keep trying to get it right, and we keep failing. We have to fail. So I know this is not an answer to your, your question. I, I don't know. I don't know how my ambition to write uh, a novel about a 20th century physicist, became a novel about the Norman invasion of Ireland, became a novel about Copernicus. I, I just don't know. Uh, as Grigor says, it's, it's, it's drift. It's, it's, but I like drift. I, I don't like... When I was young, I planned things. As I say, I planned my Kepler book around this impossible theory. Whereas I should have let it drift. I should have let it go where it wanted to go and where my imagination wanted it to go. So. Do you have any other questions? Chciałem powiedzieć, że bardzo... Will you translate okay. yes. I, I will translate it. Chciałem powiedzieć, At least I will try to translate it. Okay. <laughs> Bardzo wzruszyła mnie Pana wypowiedź o wizycie w Grecji, gdzie ta niedoskonałość była tym, co oni najbardziej podziwiali. I tak sobie pomyślałam w kontekście całego festiwalu, kiedy rozmawiamy o pięknie i o, o harmonii, o uporządkowaniu, o prostocie, jako o tych wyznacznikach piękna. I, I właściwie jak Pan teraz o tym mówił, to szło mi do głowy, że, że to uporządkowanie i ta prostota jest jakimś rodzajem te, tęsknoty, której szukamy i, i porządku, którego szukamy. Y ale tak naprawdę, gdybyśmy go znaleźli, to tak jakby to było równoznaczne ze śmiercią, bo już nie byłoby nic, co chciałoby się zrozumieć, co chciałoby się przeżyć. And my view is that perhaps uh, we are still longing uh, for this system and this uh, coherent uh, structure 
uh, because we uh, are getting to the point, when we get to the point when the system will be there, it will be equal to, uh, to that. It will be? Equal to that. It will be just the end of everything. So we are just pushing away the moment when the coherency will be there. It's a nice idea. I like it. Uh, I don't think I've ever had such a poetic question. Uh, the thing is that we won't get there, not as we're constituted at the moment. We're too flawed, we're too, uh, we're too incoherent ourselves. You know, we talk about thinking, but if you think about the way we think, it's all drift, it's all vague, it's all, we, we, we work in a mist. Um, we think that we're thinking about a, a, a I, this is one of the reasons that Newton is, is so great. Somebody said to him, how did you devise this extraordinary uh, cosmic system? And he said, uh, by, by thinking on it. It's by thinking on it. And it's a very simple question. But you need to be a Newton to be able to think in that extraordinary straight line. We can't do that. We're constantly being diverted by by things, by, you know, we're hungry or we're, you know, some beautiful creature passes by and we're diverted from thinking. So, and maybe this to go back to the beginning of the thing, maybe this is the difference between scientific thinking and artistic thinking. Artistic thinking wants drift, wants vagueness, wants to be in a fog, because that's where somehow we'll discover something new, whereas scientist has to try to get rid of the fog and think as clearly as possible. I mean, one of the things that I, that I miss in the modern world is fog. In Ireland, uh, when I was growing up, you know, we, we burned Polish coal, which was absolutely filthy, and it filled the, we had fogs every week, they were wonderful. But a fog was marvelously exciting and uh, mysterious. You would be walking along, especially at night, when the street lamps would glow like the heads of dandelions, and then you would hear somebody coming towards you, click, 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 and they would pass. Wonderfully uh, romantic and exciting. That is the, an analogy for the way the artistic mind works, is to be in, the, in wandering through a fog, lost, but happily lost, and listening to the footsteps coming towards you and receding. Believe me, you can be fed up with fog living in Krakow. <laughs> you in get fog here, huh? It's all that Polish coal. Do you have any other questions? Um, I do. Um, you said that uh, earlier before that um, the idea of incoherence is somehow beautiful and it was connected um, to, to the quantum physics, what, what, what quantum physics is based upon, that there is no certainty but just probability. Is that um, maybe beautiful to you because as an artist you might feel, as you said, a little bit homeless and what is the uncertainty here is that maybe everybody's a little bit homeless, but they just don't realize. So the idea is kind of beautiful because it's comforting. Oh yes, I mean, I don't say that the artist is the homeless. We're all homeless. We're all snails without our shells. Um, <clears throat> but, uh, I, I put it this way, that we imagine that we are singular creatures. You imagine that you're you, I imagine that I am me. And that there is burning inside me a sort of pilot light that is the essential me. This is left over from religion, the notion of the soul. But there is no pilot light in there. There is no me. I reinvent myself every second, every instant. 
I'm a new creature every instant. And this is absolutely wonderful. This is what makes life so interesting. Now, if we were all singular beings, we would be walking about like robots. You know, the, the, the invasion of the living dead or whatever. Uh, it's that we make ourselves, we imagine ourselves, we reimagine ourselves into existence at every minute. The analogy I always use is a man who gets up in his lover's bed and goes into the street and meets his worst enemy. He is two completely different people. And that happens at every level, that we are constantly re remaking ourselves. And the possibilities are endless, except, of course, that we will die. This is one of the reasons we fear death, because this great, constant, continuous reinvention of the self will end. Uh, but it's, it's what gives life its great savor. It gives it its, its sweetness and its, and its bitterness as well, but that we are you know, we're, we're, not, we're not who we think we are. And that, <clears throat> I know it doesn't seem connected with what you're asking, but I think it is true. That is a kind of imbalance. The imbalance between what we imagine we are and what we actually are gives life its, its, its constant interest. Sorry, not, not a very good answer to your question, but I do my best. Are there any other questions? I have a few more, but I'll just cut it into three. All right. Uh, when we met uh, in Edinburgh uh, for the last time, you were presenting your last novel, The Blue Guitar, mm -hmm. in which there is another concept for understanding art and what it's all about when you go to create a, a thing. You are suggesting that the artist is a thief. And your character is actually not only an artist, a painter, a former painter, but also he, uh, he curves the art of thieving, like to become the best in the world in stealing things. Oh yes, I mean, I think an artist is a thief. We do steal things from people. Um, we're also cannibals. We will eat our own children for the sake of a sentence. Um, we're monstrous, monstrous people. Um, and the, the narrator of the blue guitar is, I'm happy to say, my worst monster yet, I think. A great monster of ego and of selfishness and of uh, incoherence. I asked you about how you know that a particular sentence is beautiful. But now I would like you to ask you, is there any particular line in your novels, a single line, uh, of which you are proud of to the extent that goes beyond the regular author's acceptance? That is something that Come, comes to your mind as well, a, a well, you know, no, ideal yeah. sentence no, created I can't. by you. I, I, I can't, but I can say that in my book, The Sea, there's a sentence that people keep coming back again and again, more and more people repeat this sentence to me. It hit something in them, and it's a very simple sentence. He says, he's thinking about his past. He says, the past beats inside me like a second heart. It's not a particularly complex or glorious sentence, but it, it caught something. I mean, is, you know, at, at least 30, 40 people have said to me, that sentence resonates for me in a way that I, I don't understand it. I, mean, it's, I don't even remember writing the sentence. I just dashed it down. Uh, but that seems to appeal to people. But uh, I, no, I can't think of a sentence of my own. that They're all wrong. They're all... They're all imperfect. They're all failures. You're quite modest. Uh, no, no, I'm not being modest. I'm saying it's, it's like certainly the, the, not you know, modest. It's Many clo things I might be modest. Modest is not one of them. I'm simply being factual. All works of art are failures because they all aim for perfection and they cannot be perfect. In that line from Beckett's Worst Would Hold that's by now become a cliche, he says, you know, 
all we can do is fail again, fail better. And that's, that's what one does. Now I understand why uh, your novels, your sentences, your language is so perfect. If you find that kind of uh, sentences, that kind of language as imperfect, then you have to work more and more uh, on improving it. Well, of course. I mean, as my wife says to me, you know, if you, if you got it right, what would you do then? You'd give up. She used to say, you'd probably go into politics and then God help us all. <laughs> this is a very good line for the, for the end of this conversation. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, John Banville, a great European and global novelist of ideas and also artist, artist of language, of English language. Thank you very much, John, for being here. Thank mm -hmm. you.